Happy Easter, everyone. We are so glad you are here to be a part of uh, our celebration today. You know, I have been saying for many years now, and I'll probably keep on saying this as long as they let me talk on Easter, uh, because I just feel like this is something so misunderstood in our culture, that Easter is not the celebration of Christianity. That uh, Easter is the celebration of a very, very specific event. It's, it's sort of like the 4th of July and what's in regard to what's happened to it in our culture. You know, the 4th of July is not about a celebration of America. It's not about American values. It's not about a celebration of our military or the flag or fireworks or any of those kind of things. Uh, the, the 4th of July is about a specific event. It's about the signing of the Declaration of Independence. And you don't have to write me. I know it didn't actually get signed on that day. Anyway, that's when we celebrate it. But the way it's become in our culture, you can go through the whole day with picnics and hot dogs and baseball and apple pie and all the fireworks and all the celebrations and the waving of the flag, and, and you can never think about the Declaration of Independence. Well, in the same way, uh, Easter has become this celebration, sort of a cultural spring kind of event, and Easter has become, you know, what are we going to wear and what are we going to look like and uh, are they going to have, you know, flowers at church, which... It turns out we do have flowers at church, even at church for the rest of us. We have great big flowers at church. But you can go through the whole day and you look at everybody and everybody's dressed so nice when you go out to eat and everybody looks like Coles. It sort of looks like a Coles ad. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great big deal. I mean, it might even not be for you about any of that. It's about the Easter candy. And I get that. I love me some Easter candy. Most years we eat about $1.9 billion worth of Easter candy in our country, and I get it. I mean, I love the chocolate eggs. I love the Cadbury eggs. I love the Reese's eggs. I love the Robin's eggs. I love all of those kinds of candies. I love chocolate bunnies. I mean, we're going to eat 16 million chocolate bunnies this coming year. You can go through the whole day of Easter, and you look at the clothes, and you have the celebration, and the whole family comes together, and of course, church is a part of that for many folks, and it, we're so glad that you're here to be a part of our church celebration of this today. But really, Christ, Easter is not about any of those things. It's a celebration of a very specific event, and it's the event that launched Christianity. See, Christianity is not primarily launched by the teaching of Jesus because Jesus had taught everything that he would ever teach, and there was no Christianity. It isn't about miracles that he did because he did lots of miracles, and by the time he was done with the last miracle, when he was crucified on Friday... There were no followers anymore when he was dead. In fact, it's not even about the crucifixion of Jesus. All of those events found their meaning when this one specific event, which is what Easter is about, it's about the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It's why today, all over the world, people will begin Easter services by saying to each other, Christ is risen, and then they'll say, He is risen indeed. It's the resurrection that we come together to celebrate on Easter because in the re resurrection we find our hope. The resurrection, this whole thing about Easter, is really, it's about life and death. And today I want to talk to you about a little bit about that, and I want to start with the death side of that, because that's the side we are way more familiar about than the resurrection side. You know, there may have never been a culture quite like ours that we don't like to talk about death, but when it finally comes, death actually hits like it does for everybody we will spend a lot of money on death. Uh, in fact, I, I'm at an age where I'm trying to figure out, you know, do you have enough money investing kind of thing? So when you get to the age you can't make money anymore, you make sure you have enough set aside. So I have a guy that helps me with that, and I was reading a, an article on investment written by a smart guy, and he was talking about this growth industry, and he was talking about the funeral business being a huge growth industry in our country because, as he said, he said, there will be, over the next several decades, a growth in the deceased. That's sort of a weird phrase, isn't it? But his point is, because of the aging of baby boomers like me, we're all coming into the age where there's going to be a growth in the deceased. Well, one of the things that baby boomers have brought about with this growth in the deceased is we decided that when we go out, we're going to go out in style. So now you can get designer kind of caskets. And I mean, I've seen them all kinds, like the ones you see. You can get a, a casket. The casket like that costs $20,000. 
Or you can get one that's in your school colors and with your mascot on it and all those kind of things. Or the, for most of us, it's not our school colors. It's a school that we like to root for in athletics. You could have that in it. You can get your NASCAR favorite driver's picture on it. You can get your NASCAR colors. You can get anything you want on your casket as long as you're, wanting, you're willing to pay for it. The funeral business has become a huge growth industry. In fact, there's a company in Peachtree City that remodels mausoleums to give you more square fa uh, space and increase property value. Now, I just made that last one up because it sounded like something that would happen in Peachtree City, but the rest of those things about, I said about death, uh, that actually t is true. There has never been a generation, I, I, I don't think, that combines more of these two things. We don't want to think about death, but when we think about it, we spend a lot of money on it. But that hasn't always been the case. For generations, uh, our parents and parents before them, they, they taught their kids about death. For many of you know that there is a whole generation of people that would put their kids to bed at night by saying this little prayer. You, you probably say it with me. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep if I should die. Before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Well, that's a uh, really happy way to put your kids, tuck them in at night. You might not know that there's actually a second verse of that that goes, Our days begin with trouble here. Our life is but a span. And cruel death is always near. Such a frail thing is man. Good night, honey. Sweet dreams. I mean, people used to teach that to their kids because they wanted them to know. Death is always near. It's always present. It's always real. But death is not the end. They used to teach that death is not the end. There is something else. And I want to look at that today by, by walking you through an account in the life of Jesus that actually takes place not too long before Easter. It's a story about a life, a death, and life again. And it takes place in the life of Jesus and in the life of one of his very best friends. It involves Jesus and a man named Lazarus. Now, Lazarus lives in a city called Bethany. It's just outside the city of Jerusalem. And he lives there with his two sisters, Mary and Martha. Their house, the, the house in Bethany of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, it was like Jesus' favorite place to go when he had to travel from Galilee in the north of his country all the way down to Jerusalem where, for religious kind of pilgrimages. When he was in Judea, he liked to hang out in their home. But at the point this account takes place, Jesus hasn't been in the home of his good friends for a while because the last time he was down in Judea in their home, the religious leaders were so infuriated with him that they tried to kill him. Well, he's been gone, and now he's traveling with his guys and uh, around teaching and healing people. Well, one day, Lazarus, his good friend, goes, and he be, we don't really know what happens, but he gets sick. Maybe he one morning wakes up and he, he has a cough and he coughs up some blood, or maybe he notices a lump, or maybe there's something he's dizzy and he doesn't know why. And he goes to the medical professionals, whatever that looked like in his day, and when they check him out, they sort of look down and shake their head and say, sorry, there's, there's really nothing we can do. But Mary and Martha know there is something we can do. This is not the end. There is, we have a hope. We know Jesus. See, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus have seen Jesus heal. They, they know Jesus do, does miracles. They've watched him do miracles. They've seen him do miracles for total strangers who didn't even really believe in him. He's done amazing things in their presence. In fact, they know that if they can get word to Jesus, he will surely heal Lazarus because he loves Lazarus. In fact, when they send word to Jesus where he is with his disciples, all they have to say to him is, Lord, the one you love is sick. Now, when Jesus hears this news about Lazarus being sick, he, he does an odd thing. The Bible tells us that he stayed two days longer. When he found out that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer. Now, when you hear about somebody you care about, when somebody calls you and it's somebody you care about, when you see their number on your phone and you pick it up and they say, hey, uh, something's gone wrong, I need you, what do you normally say? Hey, I'll be right there. I'll, I'll be right over. Give me just a minute. But not Jesus. Jesus has his reasons. I mean, he tries to explain them to his uh, disciples. You can read it later. But when he hears that Lazarus is sick, he doesn't immediately even decide to go. He just stands around and he tells the guys it's going to be okay. He has his reasons, but you need to know 
Mary and Martha don't know those reasons. They just know that Jesus doesn't come. They don't know why he doesn't come, but he doesn't come. Well, eventually, he comes to the point and he says to his disciples, okay, let's go to Judea, which is where Bethany is, which is where Lazarus is. He's telling them it's time to go back to Bethany. Now, the disciples know what I already told you, and they think maybe Jesus has forgotten. They begin to remind him, hey, the last time we were there, hey, it, it didn't go so well. They, they tried to stone you. The religious leaders tried to stone you. They know that for Jesus now to be in Judea, to be in Jerusalem, is a very dangerous place that it could cost him his life. And we know the rest of the story, it, it winds up costing Jesus his life. But Jesus says, hey, it's okay. Don't worry about it. I'll be all right. We're going to go back to Judea. And one of his disciples, uh, a guy named Thomas, says to him, to the rest of them, hey, let's go die with him. Thomas is like not your most cheery, glass half full uh, kind of friend. He's more your wah, wah kind of friend. He's that guy. So they travel back and they make it back to Bethany. When they get there, Martha comes out to meet Jesus. She comes out after he waits two days. She comes out to meet him and he says, he sa she says to him, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. That's an incredibly vulnerable, touching, and a little bit challenging statement. If only, if only you had done what I wanted, this wouldn't have happened. Everybody in here has, everybody joining, you, you have your if onlys. If only I hadn't said those words. If, if only I'd let them know that I love them. If only I'd made a wiser choice. If only if I'd never taken a drink. If only I'd never done that thing. If, ever, if only I'd gone to the doctor sooner. If only I'd said to them, hey, please forgive me. I'm so sorry. And sometimes it feels like our if onlys have the final move, that they're the last word, that the if onlys are really the end of the story, but they're not. There is someone to whom you can take your if onlys, and Martha brings hers to Jesus. She brings her if onlys to Jesus. If you'd only been here, if only you'd been here, maybe she's thinking, if only I'd come in person, if only I hadn't sent a messenger, if I'd come to you personally where you were, you wouldn't have been able to turn me down. You would have come back and my brother would have been alive. Jesus says, Martha, your brother will rise again. And Martha responds, I know, I know one day, I know about the resurrection. I know one day that can happen. And then Jesus makes this incredible statement. And this statement, just so you know, becomes one of the foundational statements for his followers after Jesus' resurrection, after Easter. He says to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even though they die, whoever live, uh, even though they die, uh, whoever believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And I want to pause here for just a moment because on Easter, with all the pomp and circumstance and everything that goes on and the cultural kind of acceptance of maybe that's, there's this rumor about what it's about, we can hear statements like this and we just sort of brush over them. I want you to really listen to and imagine the staggering claims that Jesus is making in this verse. So imagine for just a moment that you have somebody in your family that's really sick, somebody you really care about, and you come to me because I'm a pastor, and you say, hey, would you, go, would you go and see them, and would you pray for them? Would you ask God to heal them because you're a pastor? Maybe would you do that? And I tell you that I will, but for two days, I don't go. And you find out that all I've been doing for two days is just hanging out at the Waffle House because I do like the Waffle House. And when I come to you and you say to me, hey, if, if only if you'd come, if only you'd come, if only you'd prayed, if only you'd been here, you just need to know they're dead. But maybe if you'd come, maybe if you'd prayed, maybe if you'd done something, maybe God would have moved and they wouldn't be dead. What if in that moment where you're sort of challenging me, but you're sort of struggling with the situation, I were to look at you and say, hey, don't be afraid. It's okay. I am the resurrection and the life. And if you believe in me, they'll live again. What would you do? Well, you'd do what every sane person in that moment would do. You'd leave. Because you'd know that I was nuts. 
because no sane person makes a claim like that. In fact, you should know no other religious leader makes a claim like this. Not, not Moses, not Buddha, not Muhammad, not anyone has made a claim that they have the power over life and death like Jesus makes in this point. And he looks at Martha and he says, I am the resurrection. Do you believe this? Jesus still asks people that question. So I ask you today, do you believe this? I mean, the, the stakes on this are, are, are pretty high. There's an awful lot riding on what you believe, not about just what you give mental assent that it might be true, but what you decide to base your life on, whether it is true or not. And, and maybe you don't know. Maybe you're a little curious about this man. Maybe you don't even know enough about the Bible or about Jesus. All you sort of know is is sort of the cultural kind of thing. Maybe you have to say to yourself, I don't know whether I believe it or not, but I ought to figure it out. I hope you'll be honest enough with yourself to maybe take the challenge, to take our three-week challenge to decide that you'll come back and that you'll learn. In the very next series, this God for the Rest of Us series, we're going to talk about how does God feel about all kinds of people, including people who don't know, who struggle with doubt, or people who are atheists. How does God feel about people who struggle to believe in him? There's a whole eternity riding on, on the answer to this. It's worth searching. And if you're not sure, I hope you'll make the decision to keep searching it out. Martha says, she says to Jesus, I believe that. I believe you are the life. I believe you are the resurrection. So he and, and her, Martha and Jesus, they go off to find her sister Mary and when they find her, she and a whole bunch of people, friends of theirs from Jerusalem, have come, they're weeping off to the side. Jesus is deeply moved by this, and he's troubled in his spirit. Now, we hear the word, they were weeping, and, and we think of sort of the cultural thing that we see when people are distressed. It's the quiet kind of sniffling where somebody is having a hard time controlling themselves. But that's really not what was going on. To get more of a cultural idea of what they meant when they meant weeping, I want you to think about what even happens in the Middle East in, in their Jewish culture even today. There's, there's a wall that every Sabbath people go to. Every Friday in Jerusalem, there's a wall that they go to where they cry out to God in deep, deep anguish. Do you know what they call the wall? It's, it's the wailing wall. That's what's happening here. There are people around Martha and Mary, and, and they're wailing. And Jesus sees it, and the Bible says Jesus wept. Jesus, Jesus wailed. Jesus mourned over the loss of Lazarus. But Jesus quickly turns toward the tomb. He looks at the tomb. He looks at the tomb, and it's a tomb like every other tomb. It's a tomb where bodies, millions of bodies have been placed. And in the moment, Jesus looks at it, and he says, Hey, remove the stone. Take the stone away. Martha says to him, But Lord... By this time, there's a bad odor, for he's been there four days. Now, the four-day thing is really a thing where she's trying to convey to him, you know, there was a cultural Jewish kind of idea that the soul sort of hung around the body for a while. For, for three days, it would hang around the body, hoping to find out a way that he could get back in and resuscitate the body. There was that cultural kind of idea, but they're saying, she's saying to them, hey, it's been four days. It, it, it's way past that. This, Lazarus is really dead, Lord. It's long over. In their part of the world, in four days, I mean, it was hot climate. They would bury people right after they had died. And she's telling him, hey, decomposition has begun to take place. Jesus isn't concerned. Did I not tell you that if you believed me, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Now imagine the drama at this moment. Jesus had turned toward the tomb, and he and Martha are having the conversation. But now everybody, the wailing gets quieter, and people do begin to sniffle, and they look at the stone, and they look at Jesus, and they wonder what's going to happen. And then Jesus says, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. When had he prayed? Over the last two days, when he waited, had he, had he been praying? Had he known what it was going to come to? Jesus says, I'm thankful you've heard me. Jesus looks at them and he says, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus does come out. 
And there's this amazing moment. Jesus says, take his grave clothes off. And they do. Then you know what happened, right? People lost their minds. I mean, you know there was a celebration, and for the next little bit, there was a party around Lazarus and Mary and Martha. Now, we don't have that recorded in the Bible at all. John doesn't even mention what happened after Lazarus' resurrection. But you know for sure there was a party. You know why I think John doesn't mention it? You know why John, I think, doesn't move on to the party that took place and how things changed at that point? Because in the decades that followed, when John finally, as an old man, finally sits down to write the accounts of Jesus and he's writing about the story of Lazarus, at that point, he knows that this resurrection story is not the ultimate resurrection story. The ultimate resurrection story is Jesus' story. When Jesus steps out of the tomb in just a few weeks in Jerusalem, when he's finished, I mean, he had mastered life, he had lived it, and he had taught people how to live. And with his death, I mean, with his resurrection, he mastered death. That became the ultimate resurrection story that they talked about. And that means that when death comes for somebody who has put their trust in Jesus, and I don't mean they believe in Jesus, that they believe that he is. I mean when they have based their life, when they put their whole trust of their life in him, that when death comes for a person like that, the grave is not the end because Jesus still has another move. Years ago, uh, I, I heard a story. Uh, I don't know if the story is true, but I know that the painting that the story is about is, in fact, a, a, a fact. It's, it's a true painting. It's this particular painting. The story goes that this particular painting that hangs in the Louvre in, in Paris, that two men went to see this painting. As you can see, it's, it's of a, the devil playing chess with a man and an angel watching over them. Well, the story is that these two men went to the Louvre and they're looking around and one of the men that, that comes upon this painting uh, is an international chess champion and he's captivated by the thought of the devil playing chess with a man, maybe even with himself. And he's captured by the fact that the title of the painting is Checkmate. He stands and looks at the painting for a long time and eventually his friend is finished looking at the painting and says, hey, let's move on, we don't have a lot of time. And the chess champion says to him, no, I'm intrigued with this painting. Something is not right. Something is off in this painting. His friend says to him, it's hanging in the Louvre. It can't really be off. He says, well, there's something off. I can't put my finger on it. You go on and you look around. The other man does go on. He comes back after some time and his friend is still standing there and he's even more troubled. And when he says to him, hey, we have to go, he goes, no, we can't go. We have to go find the curator of the museum because this painting is wrong. He says, what do you mean it's wrong? It's hanging here. He goes, the title of this painting has to be wrong. It says checkmate, but the king still has one more move. Ultimately, ultimately, that's what Easter is about. When Jesus came down to see Lazarus, and Lazarus was dead, and he had been dead for four days. He knew, Jesus knew, that if he went to Jerusalem, it could cost him his life. The religious leaders had already tried to kill him. They eventually, when he resurrects Lazarus, they try to kill Lazarus, and eventually they get their hands on Jesus. On Good Friday, they put him, they try him, they judge him, they whip him, they beat him, they hang him on a cross, and they hung him there to die. And when he was dead, they put him in a tomb like other people had been in a tomb where his body would rot away like death had done to every other person who's ever entered this sorry, dark world. And then they said to everybody, that's all, folks. That's all she wrote. End of the story. Time to go home. Checkmate. But they were wrong because the king still had one more move. And he did not stop moving with the resurrection. In fact, the resurrection, the power that flowed in the resurrection became a signal to his disciples that the power, Jesus said, was now evident in them and they began to change their world. When Jesus resurrected, there were less than a thousand followers of his in the whole world. But 40 years later, when the emperor Nero, which is one of the only two emperors of Rome that most of you even know, you know, you know Caesar Augustus and you know Nero. And the reason you know Nero is because he burnt down the city of Rome. Well, when Nero burned down the city of Rome only 40 years after the resurrection of Jesus, there are now enough followers in the city of Rome that he can blame the burning on the Christians. That means that in just 40 years, it had gone from less than 1,000 people in the city of 
Jerusalem to now this movement by resurrection power has grown to the place that they have traveled thousands of miles and there are enough of them in the city of Rome that it's plausible for the emperor to say they caused it. In 300 years, they'll become the official religion of the whole Roman world. And over the next 2,000 years, they will change our Western world in such a way that you've been so deeply affected, whether you believe that Jesus was resurrected or not, that his followers, by the power they claim at the resurrection, has so greatly affected your world, you cannot imagine what it would be like without it. But I tell you, it's not just the impact that the resurrection has had on our culture, it's impacted human lives. It's changed mine. Before I met Jesus, I did what I wanted, how I wanted, to whom I wanted, and I did not care who got hurt. Mostly the person who got hurt was me. My life was unmanageable and out of control, and I was hooked to things that would destroy me, and ultimately I felt like we're about to kill me. And then Jesus found me. And by his resurrection power, slowly over time, he unhooked me from things that were keeping me away from people and away from him. He eventually unhooked me from the anger that had driven me since I was a little boy. And he caused me to be a person who can ultimately love other human beings. And it's not just me. All around you are sitting people that would, around people that would claim that Jesus is alive and that they know he's alive because the power that raised him from the dead has raised them from the dead and has changed their lives and changed their homes and changed their marriages and changed the way they see the world and they have hope even in the face of death because of the power of the resurrection. And I tell you all of this as a way of saying to you, I don't know you, and I don't know what you face today. Maybe there's stress at work. Maybe you're overwhelmed with some disease. Maybe there's a financial pressure you face. Maybe you've done the wrong thing or said the wrong thing, or you made a mistake that feels so big to you that it feels like the end of your story. Maybe there's a son or daughter that you deeply love that you have caused to be so estranged from you, and they're struggling, and you can't help them. Maybe your marriage is failing, or maybe it has already failed. Whatever you face, whether it's today or tomorrow, the promise of Jesus is that everyone who puts their trust in, who bases their life on me, there is hope for you because he lives. The resurrection power that raised him from the dead is available for your situation. So even when it feels like checkmate to you, that's not all, folks, because the king still has one more move. Thank you.